And can I say that Winston is absolutely correct. Rodeo, rodeo, rodeo. Is that because you say finance as well instead of finance? <laughs> It's because I say things correctly, oh, Joe. I would be too differ. And that's how you got into the national <laughs> campaign launch, isn't it? Finance and Rodeo and <laughs> rode, rode your way on in. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Raw Politics Newsroom's weekly podcast and video chat on the big political issues. I'm Joe Moyer, and with me today I have Mark Dalder and Tim Murphy. Before we get into things, I have a new mug today. This one I handmade at a pottery course, and I'm very proud of it, so I've brought it along for all to see and enjoy. You're welcome. I brought, bought this one at Briscoe's in 2020. <laughs> Didn't make it, though. No. Today, we are going to discuss that tiny thing called the election campaign. Now that it's fully underway, of course, and we'll take a look at what all those party donations are paying for. And to wrap up, we will offer some recommendations. First up, last weekend, Labour and National launched their campaigns in Auckland. Tim Murphy and myself were both there. Some Freedom New Zealand protesters tried to spoil the celebrations for all. Tim, some of them managed to infiltrate Labour, while National managed to keep them out for the most part, apart from outside the building, of course. What did you make, I guess, of them turning up, and, and what sort of impact it actually had on those campaign launches at the weekend? Yeah, Joe, it was interesting, wasn't it, that at the Aotea Centre for Labour, the freedom protests were very loud outside, and then they'd infiltrated, right? But what it achieved, I think, by having six people get up one by one, um, after each other and timed into the speeches, was that it actually brought Labour together. And it's one of those things where tribes get protective of themselves and defensive. And so once they'd worked out this was going to happen, they all gathered, stood, clapped, cheered, chanted until the offending person was removed each time. And it, it really did um, put a bit of a frisson through the whole thing. And, you know, I think... Chris Hipkins responded. He he perked up as well. And they already had the red meat of the Nicola Willis tax package that they were trying to unpick and throw doubt on. They knew they had a policy coming. And then that just gave it a bit more life and spirit. So I think that that, that respect, it was a failure for those who protested. Um, Labor should have a decent look at itself and its security people for one thing. All these people were sartorially definitely not Labour people. They were very oddly dressed and they weren't dressed in the Labour way. And if I'd been in charge, I'm sure I would have been spotting them at the doorway and evicting them. But Put to Murphy on to the door. That. The next day, the national one, the national one, yes, they protested outside. National kind of tried to pretend that its security and its um, vetting had prevented them coming inside. But I walked in relatively late to that venue, didn't spot anybody asking me anything and went straight through to where I needed to go. So I, look, I just think basically the freedom people didn't decided not to disturb and infiltrate National. Um, they left them to it. They're more sort of disposed to their end of thinking. And uh, I think that was just how it was. They protest outside. Bishop Tamaki got on the TV channels and said his thing and that was enough. Now I'm wondering what you were wearing, Tim, that they let you straight through. <laughs> Your National Party blue jacket, <laughs> grey trousers, you know, National Party on holiday, basically. You were riding a tractor as well, just to get the point across. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to have a chat about uh, the back and forth that has happened is, uh, since the campaign launches, which seems to be all about you're being mean to me. No, you're being mean to me. No, you're being mean to me. It has been quite ir irritating if you haven't picked that up already. Um in terms of these attack ads that seem to be going on, Mark, what have you made of it? It's just relentless at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, it started on Monday. Yep, Monday, sorry. Been a long few days um, with uh, the CTU running a series of uh, attack ads against Christopher Luxon and the National Party. There was a bit in there that was sort of personal, you know, calling him out of touch, but a lot of it was, you know, policy focused uh, around what the impacts uh, the CTU believes would be of Nationals policies. Uh, Chris Bishop, Nationals campaign chair, called a, a press conference on the tiles in Parliament and basically 
uh, cried foul, saying we're not playing, uh, you know, a, a game, you know, a personal attack game. Labor and their uh, sort of affiliates shouldn't either. Um, I, I think, you know, it was on the front page of the Herald. It was it was quite well, um, you know, marketed the the CTU campaign and so big billboards felt, and yeah. things as well. They felt good. they had to respond somehow, and and clearly decided that you know trying to claim the high ground would be the way to go. I don't think it came off right because if you're really you know doing the kindness thing, you probably don't make such a big deal out of it. You know, Jacinda Ardern, you can imagine the inverse, never would have called a press conference to call attention to people being mean to her. She would have ignored it. Some media would have asked her and said, what do you make of this? And she would have said, oh, I don't I don't um, pay much attention. That's their business. I'm just focused on my campaign. Yeah, that switch between Jacinda Ardern and Chris Hipkins has been really evident in that for the next two days. Uh, Chris Hipkins turned up at a press conference with sort of a rolled up wrapper paper waiting, just desperately waiting for a journalist to ask him, what are you holding, Mr Hipkins, so he could pull out the next round of ads that his staff had gone gone away and, and found. But yeah, it is, it's just pointless in the sense that all it does is detract from actually talking about the policy they've released. At the weekend, Tim, at the Labour campaign launch, we had the dental policy that was announced, which was I mean, it was it was pretty clever from Labour, let's be honest. Everyone had been sitting there waiting to see what they were going to do because, of course, the GST-free um, fresh and fruit frozen vegetables had been an absolute drop um, and hadn't got the sort of reception that they'd hoped for to the point that it hasn't actually really been talked about again ever since. In fact, I think you might have even mentioned at the weekend, Tim, that they didn't even talk about it in their uh, speech at the campaign launch. But you did have this dental policy. Big announcement, um, short of it, is by sort of mid-2026 you would have... Uh, under 30s having access to, to free dental care. Um, in contrast to that, National didn't have um, a policy announcement, of course. And now, because of all of these attack ads going back and forth and the fact that everyone's just talking about that, the whole dental announcement, which you would presumably think Labour would be wanting to spend quite a bit of time talking about, it hasn't been in the media for days because of all this other fluff that's going on. But on that, Tim, the, the difference between National and Labour and having a policy announcement versus not... Do you think that was a mistake by National to not have something to pull out? I do, because it just seemed like it was a two-dimensional launch. Uh, as I said before, Labor had several things going for them, and one of them they knew was a policy launch. The other was to attack National's tax policies. Uh, and then, of course, the, the freedom people. But National won was a brilliant performance and a lovely kind of show uh, but you've got to watch out. You're all not all sort of show and not substance on that. I, I think it also meant that when we went out, Joe, with all the other journalists at the end of the conference of the launch, at least, and and spoke to him, all he was asked about was stuff he didn't want to talk about. If he'd had a policy to launch, he could have then been focusing on that. But of course, it was all about the holes in their tax um, policies, the problems with the tax treaties. And that dominated the whole thing. So part of these things is not just to launch something for the sake of it, but also they can sometimes be defensive. It can fill up the oxygen, take out the oxygen, fill up the air, you know. But can I just add, I, I don't think any of the examples I've seen are personally attacking of anybody. To say that, um, you know, Chris Luxon is out of touch, well, if that's a personal attack, then, you know, we may as well all give up. <laughs> If they'd said he, if they'd said he's bald and speaks funny, then okay. Or, or you know, he's he's in his past, he's done X, Y, and Z personally. It was lame, and all those ads that Christopher Chris Hipkins at least um, held up, none of them. I mean, okay, calling you a communist and putting on a horse—that's not a personal attack. Come on, um, you know, really, we are in sort of passive aggressive rather than um, attack ads. And going back to your point, Joe, about the timing of that CTU ad coming straight after um, Labor's dental uh, policy, it also came after a day when National was grilled about the problems with its taxes and its tax policies. And it kind of wiped out for a good part of that early part of that news cycle, the continuation of that examination. So, you know, that helped National off the hook a bit. Um, subsequently things have come back. but So, you know, these things have risks and I guess they're thinking they've got nothing to lose now. There's, they're so far behind as far as the left's concerned that they've got to play some of them. 
Yeah, I, I also just want to say, Tim, I, I kind of slightly disagree with you on the you know interpretation of Chris Hipkins's response to the complaints about the ads. I didn't get the sense that he was necessarily crying foul in the same way as National, but more trying to say, look, this is just part of the game. Everyone's got ads. Some of them are slightly offensive. Many of them depict us in unflattering ways, or in Hipkins's opinion, uh, flattering ways. He said he looked quite good on a horse and described the horses on the ad, showing him and other ministers as sort of Russian. Uh, Soviet Cossacks. Um, he, he said that the horses were Russian as well, which led me to wonder, but not ask out loud to the prime minister, what makes you think the horses are Russian? Um, they weren't wearing the hats. Hipkins and his ministers were. So that's an unanswered question that Newsroom will be seeking answers to over the coming weeks. Well, I also left a question unasked this week too, which was obviously in light of the glorious ad that we got from uh, Winston Peters uh, of him on his horse, which interestingly is called Bo, not his RIP deceased dog Bo, but this horse was also called Bo. And, you know, he jumped on that and talked about the rodeo, which everyone kind of got up in arms about because most of us say rodeo. But I haven't bothered to ask Chris Hipkins whether he or Winston Peters looked better on a horse. So, of course, that is a question that Newsroom will get to the bottom of as well. And can I say that Winston is absolutely correct? Rodeo, rodeo, rodeo. Is that because you say finance as well instead of finance? <laughs> it's because I say things correctly. Oh, Joe. I would beg to differ. And that's how you got into the national <laughs> campaign launch, isn't it? F- finance and rodeo, and <laughs> rode, rode your way on in. <laughs> now it's time to talk about money, money, and more money. Mark, you have got some great charts, which we've talked about before, looking at the political donations at play. Can you just give us a bit of a rundown? Who has got what at the moment? Yeah, so uh, this is a a chart displaying the cumulative donations each party has received this year. It's only donations above $20,000 because those are the only ones that have to be reported you know, in the same year as they occur. But it's got national at $2.2 million uh, so far, uh, ACT at just about $1.6 million, and then New Zealand First, the Greens, and Labour are all hovering around 600000 each in that zone. And so, you know, national, based on that, has outspent uh, or out- outraised Labour by almost four to one. Um, you know, it's it's interesting act particularly punching above its weight from a proportionality perspective, but also given these are large donations, it it's kind of aligns with what we'd expect. Because as those uh, over 20,000 donations come into the Electoral Commission, that's live, that's real time, right? And yeah, going within straight. 10 days of a party receiving it, they have to tell the Electoral Commission and the Electoral Commission puts it right up. It's got right. the, the name and information of the donor, basically. Because the other interesting part too is uh, Labour has done this campaign recently. Um, it finished at the start of August, I think. It lasted all of about five days. I think maybe August the 7th it wrapped up, where Helen Clark had uh, put her hand up and said that she would match dollar for dollar um, donations up to $200,000. So in five days, Labour managed to get 200000 worth from sort of, um, you know, grassroots uh, Labour supporters, matched by Helen Clark. So $400,000 in five days, not a bad effort. But as you've said, those um, donations above $20,000 are the only ones reported. So whilst Labor's number is a lot smaller at the moment, they could actually have a lot more money in the tank, right? Because they could have like a whole ton of smaller donations, which I think Chris Hipkins has said quite a few times that that is where most of their money comes from. And I believe uh, National's campaign chair, Chris Bishop, also said that they are getting a lot of money through in that way as well. So even though their number's quite high at the moment, it will be even higher once you bring in those those smaller donations into into account as well. Yeah, well, Labour will be getting its money from small donations, but also from expensive T-shirts um, and caps and cups. I had a look at the two launches at the weekend and, and Labour's T-shirts with the slogan of In It For You, or the Māori version of that, are 35 bucks a throw. Beautiful red, but 35 bucks. Next day, national, and they might be spending their donor money on subsidising this, or else they've drilled down the suppliers in Bangladesh. But um, national is 15 bucks. So Labor's getting a lot of a, a cool uh, profit margin on that, which is in, inflating their, their take. How else they're spending their money? Look, I think national plainly spent a lot of money on that launch. It was a very sophisticated, very high in video, the musical options um, and the production values. 
that the way it was all done was aimed to look slick and to look expensive, but it would have cost them. Um, more so, I think, than Labor the day before, which was a more limited, contained, um, even though Labor does those things well with its arts and entertainment supporters. Uh, so I think National's spending a bit of money there. They're also spending big time. I think if you talk to people who spend a lot of time on social platforms like Insta and even TikTok, uh, through Facebook and YouTube, uh, people who spend their time on there are noticing, depending, I guess, on the algorithm, but a lot of people are noticing uh, lots of blue and yellow electoral ads, very few yet of the red, green even, and I thought the Green Party would be more evident so far, but they're not. And that's maybe to be expected. They've got more money. They can just make it last longer and go for it. But that's certainly dominating, I think, so far. Honestly, $15 for a T-shirt, that is an absolute steal in this economy. Like, Presumably they've got Sam Uffendale and Tim Vandermull and sort of hand, hand sewing them in a basement <laughs> somewhere, making up their dues to the party for their uh, past sins. To be fair, Labor's backbench is quite, yeah. quite large. They could be using that to be uh, They will, they will a need a job it. soon. So. And, and Joe, I didn't buy either. I, I was tempted. I once bought a New Zealand First one at one of these conferences, um, but that was only to prove that it was made in China, which it was. So that the next day after I did a tweet saying their T-shirt was made in China, they withdrew them and issued a New Zealand one about two days later. So you've got to get the evidence. I just assumed you didn't buy a National Party one because you'd already bought one earlier. That's how you got in. And also, as we talked about earlier, fashion sense. <laughs> <laughs> Um, billboards. Now I drive around a little bit and I had noticed that the National Party had got out with lots and lots and lots of billboards really early on. But I actually think that Labour is catching up. I reckon there are a lot of Labour billboards out there at the moment. What's Auckland looking like, Tim? Um, well, Chris Hipkins has got two of the very best you can get, which is tip top corner on the Southern Motorway. So each direction, he's got this massive in it for you with him on it. Um, which is a pretty prize, almost as prize as the tip-top ice creams themselves, which dominate that building. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's certainly come back, Joe. Uh, they are the most defaced, though. The, the clever people are finding new things to say on them, um, which we won't repeat some of, but, you know, uh, they're there now and they're in numbers. I, yeah. I think my favourite defaced hoarding so far has been uh, a Green Party hoarding, which someone tried to write woke on, but they ran out of space, so they just wrote walk. Um, <laughs> you know, presumably greens, free uh, Chinese cookware could be their next policy. You never know. The other thing probably worth talking about is sort of influences. Now, Radio New Zealand had a good story this week about uh, Neil Quigley and the relationship between him as the Vice Chancellor of Waikato University with uh, Shane Riti, who of course is National's health spokesperson, and the policy that came out from the Nats around a, a new medical school um, at Waikato Uni. Mark, you took that story one step further um, in terms of the other hat that Neil Quigley has. Um, should well, you just explain that. That's yeah. much easier than me trying to. Yeah, so Neil Quigley is also the uh, chair of the board of the Reserve Bank. And so, you know, it, it raises, given all of the um, controversy that we've seen and, and discussed in some cases earlier this year around board members and political neutrality, some questions there. You know, it's, it's very clear, to, to be clear, that Quigley was acting in his Waikato Uni role while he was, you know, emailing with the Nats and, and helping work on a policy. Um, at the same time, you know, it was quite political, the, some of the, the emails that um, RNZ reported on, including, you know, Quigley describing the, the medical school, school as a, a present for, for National uh, in its second term as the first sort of intake of students would be in 2027. The Reserve Bank is an interesting beast. It's its, its own independent body. It's not a crown entity. It's not governed by the Public Service Commission. As far as I can tell, there are no rules for its board members regarding political neutrality, but you'd clearly have some expectations around that. So um, it would have been nice to hear back from Quigley, but he didn't respond to my uh, inquiries. And um, yeah, that's that. Mark, who appointed him? I believe Grant Robertson reappointed him um, f part way into their first term, I think. Uh, and he's yeah he's been uh, on the board for a long time and um, yeah is quite a sort of um, common face around there and, and a close sort of working relationship with Adrian Orr and yeah because it, it look it was a very very dubious 
use of language in those emails. You could say, yes, as the Waikato, you know, Vice Chancellor, I'm going to provide all the information because you need it, whoever, whichever party or all parties who want it, I'll give it to them. But then to talk about, you know, when you get your second term, this would be a gift for you or a present for you, highly, highly, I think, um, unwise as it's turned out, but also indicative of not particularly professional kind of interaction as well. So he, he needs to look to that, I think. And, and you know, National, I don't blame National for seeking every bit of information out of him um, before they do their policy. I would, if we were doing something, some sort of organisation was doing something with a, another university, you'd want that from the horse's mouth stuff, wouldn't you? you you're not going to rely on third parties, but his communication and kind of the intent he showed is, yeah, lots of questions. And it just does feel a little bit like there's a double standard here. You know, Rob Campbell, obviously slightly more political comments in, in terms of what he was writing, but they weren't related to his uh, portfolio, you know, area and health or in the EPA either. It was about three waters. So I don't think the excuse that, you know, it, it doesn't technically have anything to do with the Reserve Bank quite washes. Um, Grant Robertson has chosen to not do anything about it and say, look, I'm sure that um, Quigley and, and the rest of the board know their uh, responsibilities and obligations. It, it's a tough sort of position to be in in a campaign period. You don't want to sack someone and look like you're engaging in political retribution. But, um, yeah, it's just kind of a slightly messy situation all around and, and might have turned out differently if it had come up earlier in the year. Our audience question this week is, why did Christopher Luxon discard the ULA presented by Pacifica members immediately before going on stage at his campaign launch? Now, this is an interesting one because both Tim and I noticed this when it happened at the campaign launch. Uh, he had it on for all of about 20 seconds, I think, and then kind of handed it off to a staffer and, and got up on stage. Tim, have you managed to find any answers to this question? Joe, I have not. I've put some questions and reminders to uh, his camp, and it's, I think, either they're very busy, which is possible, and or they're not quite interested in discussing this fleeting moment, but a moment that was noticed by uh, someone else who sent us in a, a question saying, you know, what's going on there? So this was a fleeting moment, but it was a, it was surprising because it's a sign of respect given by a member of Nationals um, Pacifica community who were there inside. And as we know, they pride themselves on saying only their people were inside. So it wasn't some rando um, gift. It was a presentation to him. He received it walked about 10 paces, took it right off over his, his neck, gave it to the woman who was sort of the stage manager, it looked like, um, and, and then strode on with the cameras and the lights and right into the main spotlight uh, to give his speech. Now, people might say, well, you know, okay, that's fine. He didn't want it on him. But, but the questioning has got to be, A, you know, if someone puts one of those ula around you and you don't know what it's about, you probably don't remove it because it, you know that it's at least got a cultural and a respect and it's come from your people within your party who has tried to you know, recognise and be obvious with uh, its diverse specific community, among other things. Um, it could well have been that because it was red that it was discarded because red's not the colour. And as you know, the whole scene was in darkness and dark blue, Joe, uh, at that hall and he had his smart suit on and it's not the sort of thing. But... Look, I just think it was one of those things that was a missed opportunity and was a surprise and would have surprised those who take note of these things. And there would have been a little bit of feeling about it. People forgive, of course, but it just I'd, I'd, I'd just throw forward to election night, Chris Luxon, should he win it? He's winning, he's on the stage, and people are putting Ula and other things around his neck. I would hope maybe that he learns from this one. Let's wrap things up with some recommendations, something you've watched, read or listened to this week that you have enjoyed. Mark? Uh, I uh, enjoyed Al Gore's new TED Talk uh, on climate change, believe it or not. Um, you know, it's it's a good update to The Inconvenient Truth and um, an inconvenient sequel, which was the title of the second movie. Um, but, you know, puts the focus on fossil fuel companies and, you know, unsurprisingly, I enjoyed it. Al Gore giving a TED Talk. Al Gore is very verbose and long-winded. How did he compress it? It's 25 minutes, so... Oh, gosh, okay. <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> I mean, that's the length of a raw politics podcast. I'd say it's the perfect length. Yeah. Or one of my articles read out loud. <laughs> 
Now, my recommendation um, is for the story we talked about, uh, Guy and Espiner's RNZ investigation to the Waikato University Vice-Chancellor, Neil Quigley, and his kind of inopportune communications with National over having a med school there. And my recommendation is none other than Newsroom's pro editor, Jonathan Milne. He did a great story this week called Act Candidate Fails to Publicly Disclose Real Estate Censure. Interesting read. Obviously, actors had a few candidates fall over and off its list completely. Uh, this one's still on the list, but uh, certainly some question marks around that one. So check that out on newsroom.co.nz. That's it from Raw Politics for this week. Thank you to our producer, Hugo Stewart, and our readers, listeners, and viewers. Please send any burning questions you have to me, joe.moyer at newsroom.co.nz. You can find us next week, same time, same place, here on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts.